When I was a small child, I loved classic literature and, and movies. And in particular, I loved Dr. Seuss's Horton Hears a Who. This is a story about a curious elephant, an elephant who discovers in a tiny dust speck a world unseen to the naked eye, a world spotted with cities, cities inhabited by tiny creatures called Who's. And as I've moved through my scientific training, I've had the opportunity to um, have fantastic mentors and research experiences in ecology and molecular genetics and focusing eventually on microbiology. And I've come to reflect on that elephant friend of mine and realize he's a microbiologist just like me. Because if we take our electron microscopes and focus them down on that tiny dust speck, we see that Horton was absolutely correct. On this beautiful terrain of a dust speck or a grain of sand, we see that that um, landscape is teeming with microorganisms, bacteria, about a thousandth the diameter or the length of a yardstick, tiny microbes of all different shapes interacting in fascinating ways. This could be actually the bacterial community that's coating your shower stall. It could be that thing that's clogging your drain at home. This could just as easily be the bacteria on the surface of a plant, the surface of our skin. It could represent a mere fraction of the one trillion, with a T, one trillion bacteria that inhabit our gastrointestinal tracts. This microbial ecosystem that we call the human gut microbiome. This could also represent the unlimited number of bacterial communities that literally blanket our planet in a thin veneer of microbes, or that live in the water that covers 70% of our planet. Microbes rule the world. One of the grand challenges today in science is these who's. Who are they? What are they doing? And how do they do it? And that grand challenge will require of us to interact in collaborative research efforts. Microbiologists like myself, side by side with physicists, ecologists, computational biologists, clinicians, engineers, all tackling this challenge. And I believe by determining the interactions, how they interact with one another, will ultimately benefit us. The first pioneers to begin tackling this challenge began doing so in the late 1800s, people we are all familiar with. Louis Pasteur, for example, the first scientist to take one of these organisms out of that complex environment, bring it into the lab to study it. In fact, my ecologist friends now tell me, in the last 10 years with the advent of new DNA sequencing te technology, that the vast majority of bacteria inhabiting our planet, well over 99%, we have no idea how to grow them in a lab. No idea. We don't even know what they eat, so we can't bring them into the lab. And there's a whole new field called metagenomics, where we are simply studying the who, the what, and the how, simply by studying their genetic material. Those that we could bring into the lab, some of the first critical observations made were that these bacteria are sensing and responding to chemicals in their surroundings. For example, small particles of food like this orange hexagon, in the presence of food, bacteria turn on the genes to utilize that food. And the aquatic vibrios that we study in my lab are no different. In the presence of the material that makes up crab shells and zooplankton molts and krill, this uh, small complex sugar called chitin, in the presence of chitin, vibrios upregulate the genes or turn on the genes to utilize that chitin. In the 1970s, some new pioneers of microbiology began making some astounding discoveries. What they were observing is that not only were these chemicals surrounding bacteria, but some of the chemicals surrounding the bacteria were produced by the organisms themselves. And this was a little mysterious at first because the levels of these small chemical signals were quite low. And it appeared like the bacteria were screaming, we're here, we're here, we're here, just like Horton's who's. What wasn't at all clear is who was listening and what were they doing when they were shouting so much? 
What was amazing about these pioneers of microbiology was that they began rethinking how we thought about bacteria. Maybe bacteria weren't antisocial loners like I'm depicting here. Maybe, in fact, bacteria were social organisms. And it turned out they were absolutely correct. So if you take one bacterium and bring it into the lab, and you allow that one bacterium to double into two, boop, then four, eight, 16, 32, 64, bacteria double very fast. In 10 to 15 minutes, they can double. So by the end of the day, you essentially have a large collection, a whole group of bacteria. What these pioneers of microbiology in the 70s and then 80s and 90s discovered is that when the bacteria reached high enough numbers, there was enough of that chemical signal that they were producing, that bacterial language, that the entire population, its receptors on its surface, could recognize those small molecules, and all billion bacteria now in the group synchronously turned on their genes at the same time. This process is now called quorum sensing. And we, in fact, believe all bacteria do this. Bacteria are single-celled organisms, but they orchestrate group behavior. Some of the best studied bacteria where this was first described are pathogenic bacteria that cause human disease, fatal diseases. I studied one of these in my lab, for example. When these bacteria reach high numbers, it is only then that they turn on their nasty traits like toxins to cause disease. This is gang behavior in bacteria. They're mounting an attack when it makes a difference. Of course, now we think, too, that the vast majority of bacteria, that other 99% that we don't even know how to grow, they quorum sense as well. And they're doing that. They're using chemical information, chemical communication, to perform vital services on our planet, like produce the oxygen we breathe, like recycle nutrients, like perform um, biodegradation, involved in fundamental processes that all of us need for our health and the health of our planet. We also began realizing, though, at that time, that we were probably coddling bacteria a little too much in the lab. So we bring them into the lab, we grow them under conditions, optimal conditions, with plenty of food. We shake them happily in glass flasks. And we kind of treat them like zoo animals. And what we're appreciating is that some of the tricks that they might perform in the lab, that's probably just a small fraction of the behaviors they actually accomplish out in the wild. And it turns out out in the wild, bacteria actually communicate and cooperate in other ways. And one of the fundamental things that bacteria do out in nature, what is common for them, is to stick to surfaces. They hunker down on surfaces to protect themselves. Single bacteria, for example, in a stream, would be quite susceptible to the flow, or chemical attack, or perhaps predation by larger animals. Instead, bacteria hunker down on a surface, coat themselves in a thick, gelatinous material, and form what's called a bacterial biofilm, which is incredibly resistant to these ex uh, environmental exposures. We all see my, uh, microbial biofilms all the time. We see them again clogging your drain and clogging pipes. You're brushing them off your teeth every single morning. That plaque on your teeth, that's a bacterial biofilm, a bacterial community. They are everywhere. And understanding the fundamental processes of how you build these microbial communities, the architecture of that microbial city, will be essential for developments that are important for human health and also industrial applications. In fact, understanding chemical communication is already becoming critical for the development of new therapies. In fact, the ability of bacteria to talk to each other using chemical signals has led to the development of novel therapeutics that we could think of as like molecular earplugs. If bacteria are communicating with each other and only launching their attack against us when they're in a group, if we can develop a small molecule that is essentially a molecular earplug, that's a new drug. So rethinking how we interpret and process what bacteria are doing is fundamental for future developments. Basic research leading to new discoveries that benefit people. I don't want you to think, though, that bacteria just get along nice with each other. Just like us, they cooperate quite a bit, and they also engage in conflict. One of the best studies examples of this was from the 1920s. Sir Alexander Fleming, he was doing experiments in his lab, growing bacteria, and he had a, an accident, a mistake, which was he got a contaminant in that process. A mold had gotten into his lab, and it turned out this mold, penicillium, 
was producing a small chemical that was killing its competitors and its surroundings. The bacteria are doing this all the time out in soil and in dirt. Dr. Fleming didn't quite appreciate even the, the therapeutic significance of this chemical, but 10 years later, some American and British scientists developed penicillin into the first commercial antibiotic, which was absolutely in instrumental in our war effort during World War II. All of the antibiotics all of us take and things like anti-cancer drugs were derived from microbes. They came from microbes. And my chemist friends now are hurriedly modifying these small molecules because as we begin to abuse and misuse antibiotics, bacteria are becoming resistant to them. So we need a whole new line of antibiotics. And the chemists are helping by modifying them. There's also a whole separate field of bioprospectors, other scientists who are going out and doing what's called natural products discovery to find out who else is out there and what else they might be producing that could be beneficial to us. Bacteria don't just fight each other using chemical warfare, but they also engage, remarkably, in hand-to-hand -hand combat. Of course, not with hands, but by direct contact. And this has become the focus of work in my lab. We have tur it turns out that bacteria, like the ones we study, aquatic vibrios, um, produce essentially a toxic spear that they position on their membranes, and so when they come in contact with competitors in the environment, they literally can lance their competitors and kill them. That's pretty remarkable. This is called a type 6 secretion system. Many, many bacteria have that, including the vibrios that we study. And the common practice for studying this behavior is to take our expensive microscopes and zoom down to the level of single cells. And we can genetically engineer some cells to be red, perhaps predator cells, and watch as they kill, for example, green cells that are expressing a green protein. And we're essentially watching that trench warfare as these two cells duke it out. My lab is taking a slightly different approach to studying this process because we're very much interested, again, in microbial communities. And so we're taking the perspective, essentially looking at a very high altitude at this battlefield and not watching the trench warfare, but watching what happens at the community-wide or city-wide level. What happens to a city of microbes that are engaged in armed conflict? How do we look at these cities? What do these cities look like? So again, if we take a bacterium and grow it in the lab, we start with one cell and we allow it to double into 2, 4, 8, 16, 32. In about a day, we end up with a community of bacteria, a million of bacteria. If we're thinking of them, again, as antisocial loners, the consequence is that we end up with a bacterial colony, essentially, that is made of a single type of organism. And it looks rather drab. It looks like a single yellow colony. But informed by the observation that bacteria fight, and that we can ex exploit genetic engineering to make them either green or red, we can watch as a community forms among competitors. And what we see is those little colonies, about two millimeters in diameter, look remarkably different. And so what we see is if we engineer our strains so that both of them are pacifists, so neither of them are fighting, as the colony grows, aptly named colony of bacteria grow, in the center of town, in the town square, they happily coexist, and we see a mix of green and red cells. As urban sprawl happens on the plate, just like it does in our cities, red and green cells can migrate out and pioneer into new territories. However, if we allow our red killer vibrios to attack those green cells in that, in that community, in that city, the consequences are totally different. And you can see that the town square is totally taken over by the predator red cells, and very few of the green cells make it out alive. And we're, in fact, studying quite uh, deeply how it is that these red cells and green cells can actually spread and that the green cells escape at all. If we change only one variable in that experiment and allow those red killers to produce that copious biofilm material, the consequences are totally different. And now we see a beautiful architectured city of red cells, and the green cells can escape unimpeded. So we think that these experiments are literally laying the tracks for future discoveries. We're learning the rules of engagement in bacterial competition, and now we're trying to extend that into more complex systems that might be relevant to humans. 
I have an ongoing collaboration now with a physicist friend of mine named Ragu that I met at this meeting that was designed to bring uh, biologists like myself and physicists together to solve complex problems. Ragu can actually study our fluorescent vibrios in the gut, in the GI tract of a live fish. We think this is amazing because his fish live in aquatic environments just like our bacteria and commonly take up bacteria that make it into their uh, GI tracts. So we are colonizing his fish with our bacteria. And we're asking a pretty simple question at this point. We're asking, can we develop a relatively rudimentary or simple microbiome of green prey cells, and then if we feed the fish our red killer cells, can they invade into that community and take it over? This might seem like a parlor trick or a game, but we think this has incredible implications for human health. Because we now appreciate that the microbiota, the microbiome of humans, is absolutely fundamental for our health. Not only does it digest our food and educate our immune systems, but imbalances in that community affect health in ways we never imagined, say, 10 years ago. Things like ulcerative colitis. Um, these diseases are thought to be due to an imbalance that allows some cells, for example, pathogenic or dangerous bacteria, to accumulate to higher than normal levels and wreak havoc in the intestine. So there's a great deal of interest in trying to restore the balance to the gut microbiome using things like probiotics. But in fact, I would argue we know very little about commercially available probiotics and how they work. There's other ailments that include or uh, conditions in humans, things like obesity that are also thought to be due to an imbalance of your microbiome, and other things like coronary artery disease that have uh, been linked to changes in your microbiota. So we're imagining a scenario where our basic research into how bacteria fight may lead to the treatment of diseases. And we're currently develop, developing models now where we establish in a fish a microbiome, for example, that's in a disease state with an imbalance of perhaps unusually high numbers of dangerous bacteria. And we're asking whether we introduce in our live antibiotic. Can we restore balance by killing off that dangerous bacteria? What I think is particularly cool about this experiment is remember I told you my vibrios sense and respond to chitin and eat it? They also use that as a switch to turn on this killing system. So when we deny them of their preferred food, we deny them of things like krill, and we introduce in our vibrios, it won't turn the system on. However, when we provide them with chitinous material, we predict we can induce that system and restore balance. So we think this is an amazing example of a mechanism connecting diet to disease. So I hope now that you appreciate that microbial cities are actually dynamic, technicolor environments with organisms interacting in amazing ways. And that, in fact, our whole planet, our whole little dust speck, is colonized by these important microbes. Microbes rule the world, or as Dr. Seuss himself might say, although they might not be very large, it's the microbes that are in charge. Thank you.